good to be back here again in Chicago. The epistle for this uh, 13th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's out of the Galatians, chapter 3. Brethren, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. He does not say unto his offspring, as of many, but as of one, and to thy offspring, who is Christ. Now I mean this, the law which was made 430 years <coughs> later does not annul the covenant which was ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the right to inherit be from the law, it is no longer from the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. What then was the law? It was enacted on the account of transgressions, being delivered by angels through a mediator, until the offspring should come to whom the promise was made. Now there is no intermediary where there is only one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? By no means. But if, for if a law had been given that could give life, justice would truly be from the law. But the scripture shut up all things under sin, that by the faith of Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. And then the gospel, thing that according to St. Luke, chapter 17. At that time, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was entering a certain village, they met him ten lepers, who stood afar off and lifted up their voice, crying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass, as they were on their way, that they were made clean. But one of them, seeing that he was made clean, returned with a loud voice, glorifying God. And he fell on his, on his face at his feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. But Jesus answered and said, Were not the ten made clean? But where are the nine? Has no one been found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has saved thee. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Holy Father, and Son, Holy Ghost, amen. <coughs> Today, we have the example of the ten, ten lepers and the power of the virtue of faith. It says in the sacred scripture, the just man lives by faith. And when we consider the faith as it is spoken of in sacred scripture, it is always faith which is the beginning of hope and charity. And the faith that is always connected with the hope and charity Remember we call these the three theological virtues, which are called the principles of the spiritual life, of the supernatural life. And St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that there are four virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And there are four virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And these virtues are not the same. For there is prudence that is natural, and there is prudence that is of faith. There is justice that is natural, and there is justice that is of faith. <clears throat> and the same of temperance, and the same of fortitude. And that they are essentially different. The supernatural <coughs> virtue and the natural. And what makes the prudence different from prudence? What makes justice different from justice? Temperance different from temperance? And fortitude different from fortitude? The principles. The principles. The reason of the prudence, the reason of the justice, and the temperance and the fortitude. And the principles that make it different are the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And St. Thomas also tells us these virtues, they cannot be earned. They cannot be developed in any natural way. And one of the proofs, of course, is the virtue of prudence, by which the prudent man recognizes that if he burns a little bit of incense in front of an idol, for a brief period, but then he does not, uh, in his heart, accept idolatry, and 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 he and he'll never have to do it again in the rest of his life. And there's no witnesses, and no one knows that he has to burn incense in front of a little idol. Then maybe there is not a proportion between the burning of the prudence and being tortured and killed. And so the prudent man burns incense just the one time. And then another prudent man. 
He is made to burn incense before an idol. And he is made to, to do it for only a moment without any witnesses. And this man says, I cannot do it. And this is the prudence of, of the saint who is inspired by a different principle. You know that this principle is faith, hope, and charity. That we, if we burn incense before an idol <coughs> without any witnesses, without anyone knowing, God knows. And it transforms our souls from the friend of God to the enemy of God. And so therefore, we cannot do it. It was the supernatural prudence and wisdom that made Joseph suffer. That made him suffer when he found that the Blessed Virgin Mary was with a child. And he knew that, that no one knew <coughs> anything about it. <coughs> but he knew the law of God. And he knew what it said in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the law of Moses. And if he did not follow the law of Moses, no one would know. And on the one side, he knew the perfect innocence and, and magnificence of Mary. And on the other, he knew the law of Moses, which is a, a, that, that she must be put away and put away privately. It, it, it be perhaps privately, but she must be put away. And many of the fathers tell us that had Joseph not been supernatural, had Joseph not been a saint, he would not even experience turmoil. And the, father also, the fathers also tell us, many times we should suffer, but we suffer not. Many times we should worry, but we worry not. And many times we worry when we need not worry. Like St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary, when they went into, this, into the city of Nazareth, or rather, when they went into the city of Jerusalem or Bethlehem, on December the 24th, <coughs> they had no place to stay. And they had to go from place to place to place, until finally, in the middle of the night, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, is born in a cave. And we worry, and we are disturbed, but Joseph and the Blessed Virgin were not, because they had different principles. And these principles make their decisions different. And these principles are faith, hope, and charity. And here we find a case where ten men go to confession. Ten men get baptized. Ten men are lepers, and their leprosy is cleansed. And so that the leprosy signifies sin, and all of us are sinners, and we go to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Just like the Jews went through the Red Sea, and the Jews ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink. But St. Paul tells us, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. They all were there. And what happened? Only two of them crossed the, the, the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And all the remainder of those 600,000 who were over the age of 20, all the remainder of them died. So few are the number of those that live by faith. And what was the difference? <coughs> the difference was the way in which they viewed the battle. The difference is the way in which they, what they saw when they opened their eyes and looked at the world. <clears throat> Remember that there were 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones who would be of those 12 spies that would pro enter into the promised land. There were just 12 men chosen from amongst the tribes of Israel, chosen randomly. <clears throat> it could have been any 12 men. And then they were sent into the kingdom of, the, of Israel. And they were told, you are to go into the kingdom that is going to be conquered by, to, by God. The kingdom that God has promised to us. Go into the kingdom and tell us what it looks like. And they went into the kingdom to see what it looked like. They all went in, all twelve. They all knew that God said, this kingdom is going to be given to us, to the Jews. And remember, all twelve of them had passed through the Red Sea. All twelve of them had the leprosy of their sins clean. All twelve of them saw the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea. That great miracle was the true foundation of Israel. And they went across that, and they went into that, into the Holy Land. And they came back and they gave a report. And ten of them said, this land is filled with big walls. This land is filled with great cities. The men of this land are very tall, and we are as grasshoppers to their knees. They are tall, they are strong, much bigger than us. They have many swords, they have many armies, they have many weapons, <coughs> they have great cities, and we can never conquer it. You say this land is given to us, 
by God, but we see this land can never be conquered. And then Joshua and Caleb, they reported, is that this land has cities which were already built, and so we just have to go and move into them. This land has great fruits, and it has very massive uh, uh, grapes, and a huge, huge fruits of every kind. It is filled with the greatest farmland that can be known on earth. It is the most beautiful land that God has given to us. And so they both walked into the same land. They both came back and they gave a different report. And this is very similar to the ten lepers. <coughs> the ten lepers were cleansed. But what happened? Nine of them went and saw what worldlings see. Nine of them went and went just like the Jews who crossed the Red Sea. And after a short time, what did they do? They made a golden calf. And they rose up to drink and to play. You know that many, many souls are forgiven their sins. And they're really forgiven their sins in the good confession. And then, over time, they slowly abandon the faith. And over time, they turn back to the world. And over time, they slide away from God, which is why St. Paul says, with most of them, God was not well pleased. And what is it that makes a difference? Because one is prudent, and the other is prudent. One is just, and the other is just. One is temperate, and the other is temperate. One is, has fortitude, and the other fortitude. But the natural temperance and prudence and fortitude leads to damnation. And the supernatural temperance and fortitude leads to heaven. But they look the same on the outside. They were ten lepers, and they looked the same. They were all lepers. Now they are ten cleansed, and they look the same, and they are all cleansed. <coughs> but with most of them, God is not well pleased. And this gospel today is a warning to us. Who is clean? Even when we arrive at Holy Thursday nights, after three and a half years with Christ, after seeing so many miracles, after all the wonders of the life of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ says to them, you are clean, but not all. There's something about the human condition, something about our pride, something about our weakness, something about our too looking to the ways of the flesh, but no matter how much Christ gives us, no matter how close he brings us to him, like those 12 apostles. No matter how many miracles, how many gifts, how many wonders, how many times he forgives us, there will never be a time in which all are clean. Is it true that in this little chapel, this little place right here, all of us are clean? Is it true that right now, every one of us is pleasing to God and will end up in the kingdom of heaven? And our Lord Jesus Christ says, you are clean, but not all and that was in the most sacred moment of the ordination of his priests. The most sacred moment of the giving out of the very first Holy Communion. The most sacred moment when he spoke his most beautiful words that he would ever speak to all his apostles. When they would say to him, Behold, now thou speakest plainly. Behold, now we believe that thou art the Son of God. And that night, one of them will be burning in hell. And the others would deny him as cowards, though they would return and be, go to heaven, but one of them will be burning in hell. And it is a mystery of life that even though God gives us everything, and we know that he gives us everything, we still do not turn our eyes away from the vision of the world. Ten lepers said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Please have mercy on us. Why did they want mercy? Why did they want mercy? It's just like, on the cross, both the good thief and the bad wanted mercy. Both of them wanted to be taken down from the cross. Both of them wanted to be, be brought back into a normal life. But what was the difference? That the one who was on the left wanted to go back to be healthy again so that he could return to his sin. St. Ambrose says this in his sermon on the death of Valentinian, that we mentioned many times. He says, why do you not sin like you used to in your old age? Why are you not wicked like when you were young? You think it's because you have overcome your sins. You think it's because you've gotten better. You think it's because you've been cleansed. It's not. It's because it doesn't work anymore. It's because your back is broken. It's because you can't hear. It's because you can't speak. It's because no one listens to an old man. But if your health was given back to you, 
you would instantaneously return to your wicked life because it has not gone out of your hearts. And do not think that because you are old and you cannot sin like you used to, because the fire of the passions has gone out, that thereby you are pure, thereby you have overcome anger, thereby you have overcome the sins of the youth. You have not. They are still deep in your hearts. And as soon as God gave you your health back and all its perfection, you would immediately, at that precise moment, return to sin. And God knows what's inside the heart. Therefore, judge not by what you see. The ten lepers were walking down the street. What happened? We were on the side of the road. And the great prophet Jesus Christ came by. And we, we saw him come by. And we, we said, Lord Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he blessed us. And all of our leprosy was cleansed. That's really great. And all ten would have looked the same. But one disappeared. And the other nine went about their business. And they forgot what their purpose was. And our Lord Jesus Christ reminds us of our purpose. It's the principle and foundation of the Ignatian Retreat. And the principle and foundation of our lives. Man is made to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord, and by this means to save his soul. What are we made for? What is my mind made for? It's made to know God. What is my heart made for? It's made to love God. What is my body made for? It's made to serve God. We want to have sin taken away because you know that sin has many negative effects. The easiest example is alcoholism. Alcoholism is a terrible sin. It offends God. And it, but what else does it do? It causes problems in our liver. It causes problems in our relationships. It causes problems in our passions. It causes problems in all of our health. It makes us feel terrible spiritually. It makes us feel terrible psychologically. It makes us feel terrible physically. And the more we drink, the more we're separated, the more discouraged and depressed we become. And we want to overcome alcoholism. We want to overcome the sin of alcoholism, the sin of drunkenness. And so we go to our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, take away my drunkenness. And suppose that he takes it away completely. Then what? We're happy because our stomach feels better. Our liver feels better. Our friends have returned. Our health has returned. And with most of these drunkards who are now clean for 7,837 days, with most of them, God is not well pleased. Because they're happy now that their stomach is better, but they're not happy that they are, they are made right with God. They are, as St. Alphonsus says, the confession of a sick man is sick. Many a man goes to confession when he's dying. Many a man asks to be cleansed when he's dying. Many a man wants to return to God when he's dying. But scarcely one in 100,000 makes a valid confession. That's what St. Alphonsus says. Scarcely one in 100,000. Maybe one in 100,000. That's his optimistic view. And why? Because he's sorry because of the sickness. He's sorry because of how he feels. Because you see, you've learned by Alcoholics Anonymous, for instance, that alcoholism is a disease. We used to know that it was a sin that offends God. And when you offend God, it's bad for your health. Because God made our minds to know Him. And when we use it for something else, it destroys our minds. And I made our wills to love Him. And we use it for something else, it destroys our wills. He made our bodies to serve Him. And when we use it for something else, it destroys our bodies. <coughs> well, you remember when you're a carpenter, and you're a mechanic. You remember when I was in the, entered the seminary, put in the mechanic shop, and Father Leaf was there, had all his tools. And he said, your first duty is to take care of the tools. You mess up my tools, I kill you. <laughs> you know, if any tool is not cleaned after it's used, if it's not put back in the exact spot, you can use your fingers to take wrenches off and to take bolts off. You're not touching my stuff. We've got to take care of the tools in order to be able to keep working. And if we take the tools and use them for something they're not supposed to be used for, what happens? The tools become ruined and we can't use them anymore. And God gave us our body and our passions as tools. And what are they for? Glorifying God. Now ten lepers were cleansed. Everybody goes to confession. Everybody gets the grace of God. 
Everybody gets baptized. But only one returns. And what does our Lord Jesus Christ say? <coughs> Were not the ten made clean? Where are the nine? Has no one been found to return and give glory to God except this stranger, this Samaritan? Arise and go thy way, for thy faith has saved thee. The faith was given to all ten. The faith did not save all ten. The faith was given to all twelve of those spies. The faith did not save all twelve. And so it happens that as we travel through life, God gives us all blessings. He gives us all air to breathe. He gives us all the grace of salvation. And many accept part of it. But why do they accept it? Just like many people who turn away from drunkenness, and on the day of their judgment, they will say, Lord, I stopped drinking now for 13 years, 7 months, 9 days, and 6 hours. Depart from me, accursed and everlasting fire. That is what they're going to see. God doesn't want you to take a bath so that you can feel clean. God doesn't want you to take away drunkenness so that you can not be a drunk. He doesn't want to take away impurity so that you can not be impure. He doesn't want to take away heresy so that you can not be a heretic. And the same with all other sins. <coughs> he doesn't want to take them away so that you can not have that sin. And that is why he gave the parable and the warning that there was a man who was possessed by the devil. And the devil was driven out of the man. And what happened? He left his house clean and empty. We are in an age of emptiness. And emptiness is so much a part of our life that even when we become clean, we remain empty. We remain shallow. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that we were made to praise Him, to glorify Him. And it has to be done by our own free will. So ten lepers were made clean. Go show yourself to the priest. And so they did. And afterwards, they remembered in the same way that we remember after St. Anthony finds our keys. Before our keys are, when our keys are lost, we have a great devotion to Anthony. When our keys are found, we don't even know he's a saint. We forget everything. But somehow, when we receive the gift of God, <laughs> which is the Holy Roman faith, what do we do? We must return to God and give thanks. And we must give glory to God. And we must recognize that the faith is a gift of God, which we cannot earn. We think we are prudent, and maybe we are. But with this prudence, we may be damned. We think we are just, and maybe we are. But if this justice is natural, we will be damned. And so which justice do we have? As St. Thomas says, are you just or are you just? Are you prudent or are you prudent? We have the prudence of the flesh. We have the justice of the flesh. We all know about justice. We all know about it. I'm the one that built that church. I'm the one that helped in this church. I'm the one that gave you uh, your start in life to where you got a job and you're able to support your family. I'm the one and you owe it to me to give a return. You owe it to me to keep everything the way I want it to be. When the fact is, everything is a gift of God and we owe nothing to you. And nothing is owed to, your, owed to yourself. Everything is owed to God. And we don't know this anymore. And so therefore, there was one leper, and he was a stranger. He was a Samaritan. This leper knew he was not fully cleansed. He knew that it wasn't finished. He knew that the disease had come back. <coughs> he knew that Something else was required than just a good confession. Something else was required than just 5,000 days without drinking. Something else was required, and that is to return and give glory to God. And therefore he returned, and he gave glory to God. And this is what we must do. God has given us the faith. He has let us see the errors of our modern times. He has given us the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He has given us the faith without compromise. He has given us many gifts that if He had given them to others, they would already be saints. If He had given them to others, they would already have transformed their lives. But we go about our way. 
And we are proud of ourselves because, after all, we have the truth. This is the problem of the Pharisee, the problem of the traditional Catholic. He was given the truth. Now that word refers to liars and to error as well as to truth. But to consider only those that really have the truth, not to the indultarians, not to the modernists who have the Latin Mass, but those that truly believe the same faith, whole and entire, that has been handed down to us by Jesus Christ from the beginning of time until the very end. Those who hold the whole true faith and not call themselves by the name of tradition. And so those that truly have the true faith, with most of them, God is not well pleased. Most of them don't realize that it is a great gift of which we are not worthy. And then we must daily bow down in adoration to God and give thanks. And give thanks. And remember that we are sinners. We must return glory to God. The trouble is we think that we are clean and therefore now we can go about our regular business and we don't really have to change. And we don't really have to return and give thanks to God and give glory to God. With most of them, God is not well pleased. And what is the problem of our vision? We don't have the vision of faith. When we walk into this world, we must walk like the two spies, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were with ten other Jews. Remember, they know the camp they left. 600,000 men in rags. 600,000 without warriors, without army, without, they had some swords that they were given to them, but <coughs> they didn't have any weapons. They weren't, they didn't have any organization. And they went, they were all, except that they were under Moses, and they were all together in the desert, under the cloud, but they didn't have any army. They didn't have all the things they needed, <coughs> according to the world, in order to be a civilization that could conquer another one. And they went in and saw all those cities, and they saw all the things that were inside of Israel. But what did they see? They saw it as the kingdom of God. They saw it as the gift of God to them. And so when we walk around this world, we must realize our Lord Jesus Christ made America. Our Lord Jesus Christ sustains it. Our Lord Jesus Christ is its true king. And though it is unfortunate that 350 million Americans don't know that, that just means they've got an ignorance problem. Ask them a geography question. They don't know that either. It's just a problem of ignorance. I remember the last time I flew through here, uh, that was last there, there was a young boy sitting on the plane next to me, and the plane was turning down, going south, turning around, you could see Lake Michigan out of the window. And he goes, oh, man. I didn't know we were that close to the ocean, man. <laughs> uh, was there an ocean over here? I said, well, it's kind of fresh water, actually. It's not salt water. Ocean's got salt water. Mm. Different kind of water. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you didn't know that Chicago was on the ocean. You didn't know that either. <laughs> so you're both ignorant. <laughs> and the fact is that... There is, sometimes we see everything around us, but we don't know. We don't know what it is. We don't know what we see. We have a problem of knowledge. We don't know the modern scientists are idiots who are going to burn. We don't know that modern theologians and modern philosophers are heretics who are going to burn. We don't know the modern universities are filled with idiots. We don't know <coughs> that the modern world which thinks it's so powerful and so strong with the surveillance systems, doesn't know anything about surveillance. We don't know the, the weakness of the armies of the world, which are millions and millions of soldiers dedicated to Satan. We don't see what we should see. What we should see is the God who wiped out Sennacherib in a second with one angel, 40,000 soldiers died in a second. The God that sent a woman over to, to the camp of Holofernes and destroyed that camp in a, in a minute. The God that took the entire army of the, of, the, of the Egyptians and obliterated and they went for a swim in the Red Sea. This God is our God. And He is the God that made and sustains these surveillance systems. He is the God that made and sustains all these men who do not worship Him, do not know Him, and do not love Him, and do not believe in Him. He is the God that made this world. He is the one who made the new world, and not just the old one. He made the entirety of the world, and He is the one who reigns, and He is the one who is going to take His place as the King of America. He already is the King. But we should open our eyes and see. 
Open our eyes like Joshua and Caleb. And this requires the great gift of faith. Beg for this gift. And then when the gift is given to us, return and give thanks. And return and give glory to God. And recognize that we can never earn this holy gift. It's not possible. We must open our eyes to the truth, but it must be the supernatural truth. We know that Satan is vanquished. We must have the certitude of our Lord Jesus Christ as he stood there on Holy Thursday night and he told his apostles before the battle, before he saw them all run away, before the bloody sweat, before the great fight, that's what makes him a great warrior. He didn't go to battle and say, I hope it goes well. No matter what happens, uh, let's, no matter what happens, let's fight with the right reasons. Let's fight for the right cause. He had no doubt about what was going to happen. He said, Confidite ego vici mundum. Have confidence for I have already conquered the world. The devil is already vanquished. Why? Because I have decided to fight him. That's why. Therefore, he is defeated. Because when Jesus Christ, God made man, goes to battle, it is already won. And if we go to battle as members of that mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the faith that he has given to us, we must have a complete confidence that we have already won. In the battle, some will die early. As we mentioned in the retreat, Simeon Maccabeus, not Simeon, but Eleazar Maccabeus. Eleazar, who died in victory. But from our perspective, he made a mistake. We read about Eleazar in the book of Maccabees, and he was fighting in a battle. And he wanted to kill Antiochus Epiphanes, a type of the Antichrist, a most wicked man. And as he was fighting Antiochus' army, he saw an elephant. And he saw on top of that elephant a golden saddle and a canopy over it. And he said, that's the elephant of the king. That's the elephant of Antiochus. I will go and kill him. And he fought his way through about a hundred soldiers, killing all of them on the way, focused only on that elephant. And when he arrived in the, at, at the elephant, he went up to the elephant and he took his sword and he stabbed the elephant in the belly. And in doing so, he killed the elephant. And the elephant squashed him and he died. And then his fellow soldiers went and killed, and it wasn't Eleazar. It was his page. It was a bus boy. <laughs> It was the wrong elephant. And it says in the book of Maccabees, and thus he died in glory, and Antiochus would die. Antiochus would be defeated. And at no point did Eleazar doubt it. He went to kill him, and he was killed. But by the hand of God, his guts would explode several years later. And Antiochus now burns in hell, and Eleazar is in the glory of heaven. And Eleazar won the battle. Eleazar won the war. Though he killed the wrong elephant. And he was the bus boy on top and not the king. And so it is that when we go to battle, if we fight for Christ, and we know that we're all part of the great war, like Eleazar, even if we die in the battle, we do not lose the war. And we must recognize that Joshua, Caleb, Eleazar, the other brothers of the Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus himself, and all those that fight for Christ with faith, with confidence, cannot be defeated. But we must change our eyes from the natural eyes to the supernatural eyes. And this cannot be done without a special pouring in of grace from God. St. Thomas Aquinas says it can never be done naturally. It requires a special pouring of the grace of God. And that's why our Lord says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Beg for this grace. Beg for the grace to be able to have the eyes of faith. To have the confidence of the hope. Remember these three go together. The faith that produces the hope, which means a complete confidence. The faith and the hope, which produce charity. Which makes us act like Christ in battle. What does Christ do in battle? While he is up on the cross, he looks down upon all those that are killing him and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because that's how you defeat the devil. And one of those that's on his path to hell, in only a few moments he shall be burning in hell. 
He says to him, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he sees all of those who are his enemies, all of those that are destroying him, all of those set upon destroying God. And he gives them a mother. And he transforms them. What do we do in battle if we have faith? We must learn that in the battle of faith, we will fight in a different way. We will carry different weapons. And we will have a different heart than the one that was given us by nature. It must be transformed by another heart that also beats and also has red blood. But this blood is the blood of the sacred heart, the blood of the immaculate heart, the blood of King David, the blood of the great saints. This blood is different than the blood of man and the blood of Adam. Adam's blood is no longer good enough inside of us. We must have the blood of Christ. And so that's why our Lord Jesus Christ gave us this blessed sacrament, to transform our blood into a divine blood, to transform our heart into the sacred heart, to transform our faith and our minds into a, faith, a mind of faith, supernatural faith, no longer natural faith, to transform our guts into the confidence of the virtue of hope. This cannot be done without the special gift of God, beg for that gift, and then return and give thanks and give glory to God. His victory is nigh. He just wants more of us to have real faith in that already certain victory. Blessed God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.